I want to give Trevor right now the utmost respect mm. for that jersey behind him, mm. that number eight there. Mm. Mm. Trevor, my friend, good job. Uh, Thank you. The, the Black Mamba jersey. It's my favorite of all the Lakers jerseys. So if I was going to put anything on my wall, it was going to have to be that one. Well, he, no. he's uh, And there's he's a, a photo of him Bryant back there, I believe, right? That's him hugging the... Uh, who yep, that? that's, that's, Co- that's Kobe and Powell holding yeah. their championship trophies that, right there. Oh. Uh, yes. He's my favorite guest, second favorite guest. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> Trevor, you got a fan. All uh, right, I'll take it. So, why don't we get into a little bit about your writing career, how you got into writing, and, and how long you've been writing for the Lakers. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I started out writing initially as something that I was doing on the side of, uh, of a day job. And actually, I, I used to be a junior high teacher. And then uh, I wound up eventually transitioning into just full-time sports journalism. I don't even write that much anymore. Every once in a while I do, for the most part. What I do now is the, the videos for LakersNation.com. I do that over on our YouTube channel and there are other platforms as well. And then uh, I host the podcast as well. So I, I went from writing mostly into audio and video now. I do still write a few articles over the course of the year, but not like how I broke into this business, which was almost all editorial writing. It just kind of grew over time. Well, that's what happens when you uh, start something and you want to continue being the best at what you do. So uh, you start to move up and you start getting better opportunities. So there you go. See, see, you can learn something here, Tyler. You can learn something right here. Your happened? guy, your favorite, one of your favorite guys now, Trevor Lane, just gave you some information that can help you with your career. Did you hear what he said? Yes. Okay. So I'm, did you, are you paying attention now? Are you, are you, you know, are you, you talking seen? to me? Yeah, I'm to- oh. yeah, I'm talking to him. He's paying attention to Trevor, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. He's, he's giving thought, you some I good information. Trevor Ty- Tyler, Tyler is, is just only play, paying attention to Trevor, just not you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Uh, I deal with him too much. I'm sorry, Trevor. <laughs> Trevor, uh, why don't we get into the Lakers right now? Sure. Uh, a lot of people are looking at the Lakers there. They're not the team that they thought they were going to be. I know uh, you have a bunch of old players, players that you really put together in the offseason. You bring Carmelo Anthony over there. You bring Russell Westbrook over there. You bring all these veterans uh, that everybody were like, wow, look at this star-studded team. And all of a sudden, they're 8-8. Eight and eight, And what are they? I think they're in 8th place or ninth place. And they're barely making the playoffs. And everybody thinks, oh, my God, the Lakers aren't the dominated team that we thought they were going to be. And by the way, LeBron James only played three games so tell us what you think so far of this Lakers team and do you think that this team is as bad as what they have shown so far I mean I don't think they are I think it's it's hard to really analyze them we haven't seen the real team out on the floor yet even even the games LeBron played they didn't have Taylor Horton Tucker for those games who's been phenomenal in the first three games that he's appeared in this season since coming back from from thumb surgery. They're still missing Kendrick Nunn, who is their what, fifth highest paid player. They're the only other guy aside from THT, LeBron, AD, and Westbrook that's not on a veteran minimum contract. Kendrick Nunn is still out with a bone bruise. You've got players who've been shuffling in and out of this, this lineup the entire season. Trevor Reza is still a few weeks away. So we've yet to see this team really play the way they were built to play. So it's hard to analyze what they've got and what they don't. Um, I think we can still be a little bit disappointed in terms of the games they've been blown out in. Like even without LeBron, the idea of bringing in Russell Westbrook was, hey, when LeBron's out, this guy can help run the offense. This guy can help carry the the load, right? And we haven't really seen that. So I think the disappointment about the team is not necessarily unwarranted, but I don't think we can just completely write them off either and say, oh, this team is just – they're not going anywhere. No, we've, we've yet to really see the Lakers play this season. So my biggest reason why I like the Russell Westbrook move in the offseason was it takes a lot of ball handling pressure off of LeBron. And as a result, I think you'll see uh, LeBron, uh, he's been low managed a lot this year already with the injury. But still, you, we've seen we, we've seen it where they've load managed him because they want him to do all the ball handling duties. So both short term and long term, do you think that's a big factor for why they brought in Russell Westbrook rather than thinking they were going to bring in a shooter initially? There were rumors with DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry. Do you think that's the biggest reason for Westbrook or do you think it's something else? And also, what do you think long term will it be will it be Westbrook still handling the ball most of the time or do you think LeBron will take over yeah I mean I think that that the the main draw of bringing him in Westbrook first of all he's a former MVP right so just in terms of your ceiling your top end talent he brings you a little bit more punch than the other options which were Buddy Heald and DeMar DeRozan at least from the offseason perspective DeRozan's been phenomenal this season and a lot of Lakers fans are going oh wish we had we had traded for him instead but uh but Westbrook 
the ideal situation is indeed what you're saying. He takes a little bit of the burden off of LeBron James and lets LeBron coast a little bit more during the regular season so the entire offense doesn't have to run through him every single possession. Now, you mentioned, is that going to be a, a long-term thing? Come playoff time, the ball is going to be in LeBron's hands. And, and late in the fourth quarter, the ball is going to go through LeBron James. We've already seen that in the limited minutes that the two have played together, that when it's crunch time, when it's it's do-or-die moments, LeBron gets the basketball. There's no question what the pecking order is here. So as the season goes on and they get into more high-profile games, you're going to see the ball in the hands of LeBron James more and more. But it's in the early going. It's you know They've said this a bunch of times. The season's a marathon, not a sprint. And in order to get all the way to the playoffs and get LeBron healthy, they're hoping that Westbrook can kind of ease some of that burden. Now, obviously, LeBron and Russ are going to facilitate a lot to Anthony Davis. Uh, offensively, I think he's the best five-tool player they have as far as just he's able to do everything on the floor. So when Anthony Davis, who in his career has kind of been laid back, he's not very vocal about things, when he comes out and says, we suck in regards to not being he, getting dominated in the third quarter, night after night after night, are the Lakers in the locker room starting to get a little like, maybe we need LeBron, maybe he helps us more than we think, or are they just kind of like, oh, we're, this isn't a big deal right now? I mean, they, they know that they need LeBron. They've known that from, from day one. But when Anthony Davis comes out and says and says things like, we suck, uh, he's talking about the effort on the defensive end of the floor. There's That has certainly waned during certain points of the game, and it's been noticeable. Um, this team just hasn't quite been on the same page. And there's almost an element where they've got all these guys who were at one point stars, some guys who are currently stars, or maybe an all-star level player. Right? Westbrook, maybe we can argue he's more of an all-star caliber right now at 33 years old, but Anthony Davis, a star level player, Carmelo Anthony, a former star, Dwight Howard, same thing. And there's just kind of this sense that they really do have a low margin of error right now. And you wouldn't expect that with the big names. And maybe they didn't expect that either, but they are are running into teams that are beating them like the thunder, like the wolves that really shouldn't. And that's going to be frustrating. That's where you get Anthony Davis coming out and saying, we suck because we should be beating these teams and we should be performing at a higher level than this. And we shouldn't be having to push down on the gas pedal like we, we need to in these games. But then when we need to, it's not really there. We see that the effort level isn't really there throughout the entire 48 minutes. So that's something that they've got to figure out and fix. And LeBron James does band-aid that to a degree, right? He comes back and, and he solves a lot of the problems that they do have. But still, it's been disappointing to see what they've done so far, given the fact that even without LeBron, they do still have a lot of talent. Obviously, there's another California team playing pretty damn good basketball right now, and that's the Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, Steph Curry, um, what he is doing, I mean, it's unbelievable. His three-point shot, I mean, he's the best shooter we've ever seen. Uh, Is he one of the greatest point guards of all time? I think people are a little bit blind. We forget what the point guard position entails. I think he's more of just an unbelievable shooter. He's a great he's great at ball handling and doing all that stuff. And he's also a good passer and all that other stuff. But the game has changed, and we all know two-way basketball and the way that the point guards played in the 80s and the 90s and today are completely different. But uh, what are your thoughts with this team right now, the Golden State Warriors? Are the Lakers worried about how good the Golden State Warriors could be when Klay Thompson comes back? I don't think they're worried about that. It's a long season. We've got a long ways to go until playoff time. I mean, things can change a lot in the NBA between now and then. So they're focused on, from you know, the Lakers' perspective. They're not looking over over at the Warriors or looking at the Nets, which was the big team heading into the season that we thought was going to be, you know, the the chief rival of the Lakers going head to head. Nets and Lakers in the finals was supposed to be the mm-hmm. the betting favorite matchup. I know a lot of people are saying maybe that's not going to happen, but the Warriors have been tremendous. They've been great. Uh, one of the, the narratives that we've seen take hold this season is that the teams who have a real system in place and the teams who are, are really clicking together are the teams that are finding success. We're finding the, the top heavy teams with a lot of star level talent aren't quite having the success that we normally would see. And perhaps that's because of the rule changes, the, the way the game is being officiated a little bit differently. That can certainly be a factor. But the Warriors have been absolutely tremendous. 
Um, they're going to probably get better when Clay Thompson comes, comes back, when James Wiseman comes back. Jordan Poole, I think, has been really big. Damian Lee, the growth of those guys has raised the ceiling for them. And so instead of looking at them as kind of a tier two team, they're, they've vaulted up to maybe being the best team in the Western Conference, could be the best team in the NBA right now. So they're certainly a threat, but there's a lot of threats. And we'll see how this all looks as the season goes on. But I don't think there's any team right now saying, oh, man, that that team over there is just unbeatable. I don't know what we're going to do with them. It's it's too early in the season for that. So you mentioned system, and we always – a lot of people argue with, is Steve Kerr a good coach? Because he's carried about a super team with Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, et cetera. And Errol and I have always said, oh, he's a figurehead coach. He's not really a great coach. But now this year he's actually proving it. Maybe he does have a good system in place. And also we've seen it with a lot of LeBron's teams too, with him having these figurehead coaches, uh, Tyron Lou being a, an example of that. But over the years, even Eric Spolster when he first started wasn't really a, known as a basketball guy. He was a video guy. So do you think – Think, do you think a real system is still necessary for a lot of these these Lakers teams and even now the Warriors to get into place? And maybe the aspect of just having the superstars is fading away, even somebody like Steve Nash with the Nets, too. Do you think they need a real coach now to win, or you still think maybe it's still the players first? I mean, I think like back when the Warriors had Kevin Durant and Steph and Clay and Draymond, like that's that's almost at a point where, okay, just roll the basketball out and you're going to win, right? I mean, if your offense breaks down, oh, bummer, we give the ball to Kevin Durant and he's going to go create a shot for us. So those types of teams don't necessarily need a true system. And we've seen the Lakers do the same thing for years now, where the last two seasons anyway, where the offense has mostly been, well, they've got some plays and things in place. When things get tough, when it's playoff time, then – you know, LeBron's going to orchestrate the offense. Anthony Davis is going to be a major factor. And that's what's largely going to carry you through more than a system in place. However, early on in the season, uh, and the Jazz have been a team that have been criticized for this, that their system carries them through the regular season. And then come playoff time, when teams can lock in to exactly what that system is, they kind of fall to pieces, right? And that's that's what we've seen historically with Utah. So the teams that have systems in place right now and have that kind of uh, carryover from last season, they've already got guys who were in place last season who know exactly what to do, have a feel for playing with each other, have that kind of chemistry. Those are the teams that we're seeing find success, probably to a higher degree than the teams right now that are truly reliant on stars. I mean, even the Milwaukee Bucks, who've been dealing with a number of injuries, they beat the Lakers last night, but they've struggled as well. Um, not to say that they have a, a poor system or anything, but they've been overly reliant on their stars because they've had so many guys that have been out. So I think that we're at a point in the NBA where I'm not sure if the system thing is going to stick all the way through to the playoffs, but it does feel like at the moment, with the way the game is being played right now, compared to last season, compared to the season before, the teams that are really clicking on all cylinders in terms of if you've got all your role players going are beating teams that are reliant on stars. And we'll find out if that continues to be a thing in the playoffs or not. Historically, it hasn't been, but this season has a different feel to it, to me, than what we've seen in the past. So we're talking a lot about Golden State. Draymond Green, obviously, on his uh, podcast or show, whatever you want to call it, mentioned, obviously, the Lakers' uh, Staples Center is now undergoing a new name. Yeah. Is, is it because they want to kind of just create a new aura in the Staples Center, obviously, the Kobe incident and his aura is very much still in that building. Are they trying to kind of just start something new or is it really just about the $700 million? No, it's $700 million. It's not, and it's not even the Lakers. I mean, the Lakers don't, that's, they don't have the arena naming rights. Um, so Staples, uh, AEG may have gotten those rights back from Staples. We're still seeing exactly how this, this deal is all going to work out. But the bottom line is this is the biggest arena naming deal in American sports ever. And so that's what this is about. Staples paid $100 million for the, the arena, arena naming rights back in 1997 for a lifetime deal. And now they just sold it for a 20-year deal for $700 million, which is, which is unbelievable. But again, the Lakers don't really have a lot to do with this. Yes, they play in the building, but they don't have the rights to the arena. So this isn't about the Lakers trying to turn things toward, towards a new era or anything like that. This is very much a, a deal for the, the ownership group for the, the building. 